For those who haven't seen the previous devlog, this project is a recreation of an older one that I abandoned due to my lack of game dev skills at the time. It was a classic Zelda-like inspired game, but probably closer to A Link Between Worlds, since it was made in 3D. So far in the recreation, I have introduced a movement system with sprinting, jumping and dodging, but since then I've been building the foundation for the game's combat. 2D Zelda games have a rather simplistic yet responsive combat system comprising of a few attacks, putting the focus on other aspects of gameplay, such as finding secrets and solving puzzles. Puzzles. However, for this project I want the combat to be more of the focus, with attacks being slower and more weighty, while enemies' attacks are well telegraphed, so the player has to utilise the dodge mechanics. Outside of this, I have plans for damage types, elements and conditions, but I won't go too much into future plans, I may be British, but I'd rather not contribute to the stereotype by becoming another Peter Molyneux or Sean Murray. Will the game have dragons? Yeah. Will the dragons be able to drive cars? Yeah. Will you be able to become part of the Illuminati? Yeah, if you want that, yes. Will the game have nudity? No. Well, maybe. As of right now, my aim is to get the minimum requirements needed for this game to work. So combat will be centered around the sword and shield only. So let's get into the progress I've made. Before I started coding and planned out exactly what I want to be able to do with this system, I wanted to lay down the groundwork so I could potentially introduce different weapon types in the distant future. But before I could even introduce weapons into the game, I had to think about how these models were going to be loaded in and out of memory. Some may not know, in Unity, if you reference a prefab or model in a scene at any point, it is loaded into memory. This is all well and good if all model references are going to be used, but for a game where you equip different items, this soon becomes a problem. Luckily, Unity has a package known as Addressables, an incredibly convoluted system that allows you to load in and out assets asynchronously. I say incredibly convoluted because, in order to get it to work, well, you still have to write a lot of code. Plus it has a lot of systems and options that I have no idea what they do. Asynchronous loading means the asset can be loaded independent of the game's frame rate. This prevents the game from freezing or stuttering when introducing a new asset. The issue with this is you don't know exactly when the asset will be done loading. So you have to adjust systems to consider this unpredictable factor. This meant I had to spend some time building an abstract equipment class that is capable of storing an asset's reference and communicating with an asset loader. This took a little trial and error as I developed an inventory class, as I had to consider a number of situations where a weapon could be spawned in, such as when a chest is opened, when the map is initially loaded, when pre-equipped on an actor, or when equipping and unequipping from a menu. This is the weapon class derived from the equipment class. It will develop over time, but for now, this is how it looks. It has two asset references, one to the weapon prefab, this includes scripts that control its physics and ability to be picked up. It also has a base damage value. Extra weapon stats will be added as time goes on, so this is just a placeholder for now. Next we have the Stowbone setting. This is an enon that points to typical points on the character's skeleton to attach undrawn weapons. And the quick point is where the weapon moves to when it is drawn. The final section is a reference to a skill class. This is what determines what attacks are called when certain buttons are pressed with this weapon, but more on that later. I created a basic weapon spawn script, so I could create a weapon at a push of a button. Then I had to create an interaction and pickup script, so an event could be called allowing the player to pick it up. I set up a rigid body for the weapon so it has physics that are turned off when it is picked up. This is a mono behaviour that stores a serialised inventory class. Here I have references to bones on the character's skeleton where the weapon will be attached once picked up or drawn. I set up a method that collects these automatically based on their name, that can be accessed by right clicking the script. So when I introduce more humanoid enemy types, I can give them weapons too. A weapon class can be directly set on the inventory, so when the game starts, the actor starts with the weapon equipped. When nothing is equipped, interacting with the pickup will place the weapon into the same slot and have it attach itself to the player. Getting this to work with the assets loaded asynchronously took a while to figure out, but I got there in the end. Now I could pick up the weapon, it was time to set up weapon drawing. It's not often games implement such a mechanic, and often, when they do, it's just for visual flavour. I want it to be part of the gameplay, similar to Monster Hunter, where you must draw your weapon before attacking, but if you try to sprint, your weapon is forced to be put away. The purpose of this is to restrict the player's movement somewhat during combat. Dodging will use a resource, where sprint won't. This is not to say that sprinting won't come into play during encounters, as I can see it being utilised in boss fights to conserve dodge resources. To begin with, I introduced the bare bones of a combat input script. This would toggle a parameter named in combat on the animator on and off at the press of a button. This is my animator setup. 
First we have our base layer. This includes movement, dashing and jumping. Then I introduce three new layers, weapon idols. These three layers are all synchronized. The only real difference is they each use different masks. The first layer's mask includes all bones except the arms. The other two include just the left arm or the right arm. This is so I can toggle parts of the draw animation off for situations where there is nothing equipped in either hand. The default state is empty with no animation. This prevents it from overwriting the base animations. When we draw the weapon, we enter the draw state machine that will consist of different draw animations for different weapons. As of right now, there is only one, which is for the sword and shield. To control what layers are active, I created a layer control script. This way I could turn off the left arm when there is no shield equipped. On the draw state, I have the SMB draw control. This controls the draw modifier parameter which is set to 1 or minus 1 based on our in combat status. This modifier is then assigned to the state speed multiplier parameter which allows the state to be played in reverse. The purpose of this is so that the draw animation can be interrupted at any time so the sword is placed back into the scabbard. This state also has two exit transitions. By storing the state's normal time, I can tell if the animation is at the start or at the end to transition out appropriately. When the weapon is fully drawn, we then enter the weapon idle state. This creates more problems. The new weapon idle state is now completely overwriting the base layer, which is fine until we start to move and we slide along the floor. To fix this, I had to automate the weapon idle's layer weight based on what state or transition the base layer was currently in. The right hand layer will remain active though. This results in the base animations blending with the drawn weapon idle, saving me time since I won't have to animate a separate run cycle for when the weapon is drawn. I find I finally added an event call to the draw control script with an adjustable time parameter. This would call the method where the weapon moves from the scabbard to the hand and vice versa. Once this was all done, I adjusted the controls so when sprinting, the weapon was forced to be stowed. As of right now, the animation isn't perfect, especially when running. As you can see, the hand doesn't align with the hilt. I fixed this in the original project by creating my own IK system, but as of right now, it's not my priority to fix. I have access to final IK, so I may use that as an alternative to my own system, but I need time to set aside to look into that. Now I could draw the weapon, I added a fourth animation layer for attacks. Like the weapon idles layer, I utilise the empty state here for when we're not attacking. The idea here is attack 2 is a follow up to attack 1, however I wanted to keep them disconnected from each other, so that I could call them independently instead of having them flow into each other. This is why they both branch from the any state. This is the basics of the skill class that I attached to the weapon earlier. The purpose of this is to control what animation and skill effects will play, as well as contain damage multipliers for our attacks. Right now the animation ID has to be put in manually. In the future I'll set up something that allows me to pick them from a list that is easily expandable. For this reason I choose not to use an enum value here, because I have no idea how many animations there will be in the future. The enter animation ID is a variant that is only called when the combo chain is first initialized. Attack 1 has this, but attack 2 does not. The only difference is the prep animation is slightly longer as the character gets into position to start attacking. Attack 1 combos into attack 2 and attack 2 combos back into attack 1, creating an endless loop between the two, but by setting this system up in this way, I can easily introduce more attacks to the combo string. You will also notice I have separated the attacks into two separate animations, enter and hold animations of the initial telegraph before the attack and they branch out into two separate states, the basic light attack and a heavy attack. When a button is held, the animation will play in its entirety and trigger the heavy variant, but if the button is released at any time before the cutoff point, the light attack will trigger instead. Originally I found that button bashing would sometimes cause the heavy attack to trigger randomly, so I had to set up a coroutine that tracks a button press. Once it's released, it cannot be pressed again to trigger the heavy attack. This means that button bashers can bash until their hearts content without any unpredictable outcomes. This system allows me to set up multiple exit branches for a hold attack, so a classic example would be a hammer attack with multiple levels of charge. When it comes to attack chains, I had to create a combo control script with a special struct that would use length information from an animation clip and convert it into frames. This metric is easier to work with than a normal time between 0 and 1, as I know the specific keyframes in the animation for the cutoffs. With the max frame rate, I could draw sliders in the inspector that allows me to set up the grace period for the input. This is to factor in a margin of error on the player's part when it comes to button inputs. The execute frame is the earliest frame the next attack can trigger, so pressing the button as early as frame 10 will register the next attack and execute it at frame 25. Despite this, an input can be put in as late as frame 40 and still trigger the next attack in the chain. Game feel is very important here. 
If the margin of error is too small, it will feel unresponsive, but if it's too large, it may cause ugly animation transitions or just feel overly sluggish. With this setup, we can do a light attack chain and then trigger heavy attacks by holding the button. Attack 1 has a heavy overhead swing, while attack 2 has an uppercut instead. And as for right now, this is about it. There's still a lot left to do here, as you can still move while attacking, so movement needs to be restricted. I also want attacks to move you slightly forward, and I'll need to factor in when the player can interrupt attacks through movement or other button inputs. And then it's a case of introducing the slash effects and the damage pipeline. I want to take some time to thank everybody for their comments in the last video. It seems a lot of people are interested in what I'm doing here, so that's great to see. I wrote a lengthy response to Mr. Fox's comment, but when I posted it, his comment mysteriously disappeared. Maybe he deleted it, or YouTube decided to bin it. It seems to randomly do that sometimes. So I figured I'd respond briefly here. First of all, thank you for all the constructive criticism and advice. It's always appreciated. You mentioned about generic enemy designs, and I agree. I have thought about this a lot in the past myself. I have written a lot of world history and lore for this game. This includes a magic system with rules as well. I do want to create my own world and not fall into the trap of generic fantasy Zelda-like game. I wanted to design some enemies that I could get into the game and functioning, so I purposely went with the more cliché enemies. But once the initial prototype is set, I will be delving deeper into the visual aesthetic to try and make it more unique. If you like what you see and want to help me out, make sure to leave a like and a comment as it aids me in the fight against the algorithm gods. To follow along, make sure you subscribe and if you want to support me financially, I have a Patreon page. But be aware, there won't be any builds going up anytime soon and thanks to those guys who have supported me here for a while now. If this is your first time seeing one of my videos, maybe you should go watch the previous devlog here. And if not, would you kindly bugger off? Maybe.